the Space Science Center in Houston for some literal rocket science. Now, we're not going to get into all the details of rocket science in this course, but I will say this. Rocket science is fundamentally based on the idea that to go someplace, you have to leave something behind as the line goes from the, the movie Interstellar. And in fact, what they're talking about is momentum. And momentum is going to be the subject uh, of what we talk about next. And particularly, it's changes in momentum and generating those changes that can get you from point A to point B, uh, even if you have nothing to push against. So let's do some rocket science here at the Space Science Center in Houston. We're going to learn about the last major significant fundamental concept that we're going to encounter in this course, and that is the concept of momentum. The key ideas that we will explore in this section of the class are as follows. First, we will define what is the momentum of an object. We will compare and contrast that with the energy concept that we have just concluded learning about, and we're going to use momentum to revisit Newton's second law of motion to understand the implications from the laws of motion for this quantity of a physical body, momentum. We will learn about the relationship between momentum and force. And we will learn about momentum as a conserved quantity of nature. And finally, we will look at applications of momentum when velocity is changing and when mass is changing. And this will be a new angle on looking at motion in the context of this class. So we've been exploring energy, and we've been exploring motion, and we've seen how these concepts are intertwined. So what could possibly be missing? Well, before we look at the history of the idea of momentum, let's kind of pause and use this moment to reflect on what we have learned about motion so far in this course. First, motion can be described using the framework of space and time. A state of motion is described by the velocity of an object. So if you want to talk about the state of motion of an object, you should be talking about its velocity. And velocity is the time rate of change of position, the change in position with respect to the change in time. And here I write the instantaneous quantity of velocity to remind you of the role that calculus has played in helping us to understand at instance of time what the motion is. Now changes in that state of motion, changes in velocity, are given by accelerations. And we write that as a vector a, which is the time rate of change of velocity. And using calculus, one can rewrite this as the second derivative of position. That is the time rate of change of the time rate of change of position. Now it is force that causes acceleration. We explored this in the context of Newton's laws and encountered the first laws of nature that you typically see in a class like introductory physics. And then we began to explore what is traded from one body to another or lost from one thing and given up someplace else as states of motion begin to change. We considered gravity and springs and friction and drag and what is and isn't associated as quantities of energy with each of those things. We've certainly seen that motion has an associated energy, and that we call kinetic energy. And it's given by this formula, k equals one-half times the mass times the speed squared. And we've contrasted energy concepts with force concepts. Energy is a scalar quantity, and when only conservative forces are in play in a situation, mechanical energy, the sum of kinetic and potential energy, is conserved. In general, all energy is conserved in a closed and isolated system, even when non-conservative forces are present. And we have seen how mechanical energy can be traded into thermal energy or internal energy in a system that isn't given back. We can determine all information about the degree of motion of an object by applying conservation of energy. And in addition, we saw that in the situation where one has conservative forces, it is possible to relate force and changes in potential energy 
by looking at how the potential energy of a system changes with spatial position. And this is represented by the vector f and its relationship to the negative of the so-called gradient of potential energy u. But changes in the degree of motion what we're talking about there is changes in magnitude, length, sort of size of motion. But we've lost directional information. If I talk about kinetic energy, there is no direction that the kinetic energy points. If a car is moving east at 55 miles an hour, and that same car turns around and goes west at 55 miles an hour, it has identical kinetic energy in both cases, and yet something has changed its direction and therefore its velocity have changed. Is there any quantity, maybe even one that could be conserved like energy, but that somehow provides us with this crucial missing directional information when internal quantities like energy change? And the answer will be that momentum is the thing that we seek. Now momentum is in many ways, a far older idea than energy, at least energy as we think of it now in a modern context. It's impossible to do a fair treatment of the philosophy and mathematics and eventually physics that leads us to a current modern understanding of momentum. But I think it's worth giving at least a couple of highlights here to show you the diversity of thought that has been brought to bear on this subject. While it is certainly true that ancient philosophers, including some from Greece, are recorded as having thought about the relationship between motion and mass and the sort of degree of um, force that this can then Im impose on something by colliding with it, in many ways, it's the individual depicted here on the left, Abnasina also known in more Latin or Greek um, founded cultures as Avicenna, who lived from 980 to 1037 and was many things. He was a polymath for sure. That meant he did many things and he did them very well. He was a physician, he was a philosopher, he was a mathematician, he was an astronomer. And, and this would have been in now what we call uh, Uzbekistan where he was born or Iran where he, where he died. It was he that hit on the, the right idea Although, like many people prior to the, the Renaissance uh, that occurred in, in Europe, uh, much later than this, it, it didn't necessarily involve doing experimentation to verify thought. Something could be logically or philosophically true without necessarily being physically true. He hit on the idea that a body whose state of motion is changed um, must obtain, or perhaps in slowing down, give up, some persistent quantity of motion. And what distinguished him from the earlier Greek thinkers on all of this was that the earlier Greek thinkers had the misconception that the state of motion preferred by objects, material bodies in the universe, was one of rest. But of course we know from having looked more carefully at nature and then visited that observational set in the context of Newton's laws, that in fact the natural state of motion in the universe is one of constant velocity, changed only by the action of an external force. And it was in fact uh, Abnusina Sina who hit on this key idea, although it's not clear that he did experiments to actually check this. He hit on the idea that there is a persistent quantity of motion and it can be removed only by resistance to that motion, an external force. He wrote these ideas down these ideas were certainly widely read outside of the, uh, the culture in which he, he, he lived. Others certainly would have read this idea and certainly would have had their, in, their thinking influenced by such ideas later. Uh, he was renowned as a remarkable physician and philosopher and would have influenced absolutely the people that came after him that would have had access, for instance, to his published works. So skipping far forward in history, uh, in that intermediate time between Abnusina's work and much later, say in the context of Galileo or Newton's lives, many would argue about this quantity of motion. Philosophers would call it things like impetus and they would correctly surmise, although they would do so without experimentation, that it was related to the product of weight and speed. 
Rene Descartes would argue that it was independent of direction, depending only on speed. Now we, we understand that the, what probably he was really more uh, talking about, although again, it's not clear that anyone was making a distinction between these things at the time, was what we now call energy, kinetic energy. I mean, kinetic energy certainly is independent of direction, depending only on speed and mass. Galileo would pick up on this idea in his own work, calling it impeto. Gottfried Leibniz, whom we've mentioned before in the context of the discovery of calculus, um, would, would argue that velocity and not speed was at the heart of this quantity. So Leibniz was one who, in that same kind of turbulent era of thinking as science was developing into a forefront uh, way of knowing about the universe, um, Leibniz would understand, or at least argue, that it, it was direction and magnitude that played a role in this internal quantity of motion. But it was finally Newton who ultimately included all of this in a really complete mathematical treatment. Okay, so most famously, of course, the Principia, and found its change to be related to force. And this is the key thing we will visit in this lecture, is whatever this thing is, this thing we call momentum, its change has a relationship to force. And it would ultimately come to be understood as the product of quantity of material, mass, inertia, for instance, with velocity, directional information about the change of space with respect to time. So let's define momentum. Momentum is a relatively friendly and approachable thing, although it can get quite complicated as we begin to think about how changing momentum can actually work in real physical situations. Momentum is defined as follows, building on these development of ideas culminating in the mathematical ideas of Newton and those that would follow, we define momentum with the symbol P, a lowercase letter P, for instance, when we're talking about individual particles. It's a vector quantity, so it has a vector hat over it. And it's equal to inertial mass, M, times velocity, V, including directional information. So momentum, P, is a vector. V is a vector. Both of these sides of these equations make sense. And of course, we can relate v to changes in position with respect to time by putting in the first derivative of a position vector r that starts at the origin and points to where the object is currently, uh, the change in that vector with respect to time. We can see that this has both magnitude and direction. Its magnitude is the product of mass and speed. Its direction is given by the direction of the velocity vector. It is a vector quantity. So just as an exercise, let's do a little comparison for the same physical object in the same state of motion. Let's compare its kinetic energy and its momentum. So I like to think about an electric car. I own one, so I'm a little biased in that regard. So let's say we have an electric car with a mass of 1,700 kilograms, and it's traveling eastward at 55 miles an hour, kind of that little example I gave you before, but let's put a mass into this now. Okay, well, we can convert 55 miles per hour to meters per second. It's about 24.6 meters per second or thereabouts. So, great, we've got everything in, in MKS units, and we can now go ahead and do things like calculate kinetic energy in MKS units. So the kinetic energy of the car, K subscript car, is one-half times its mass times its speed squared. So one-half times 1,700 kilograms times the quantity of 24.6 meters per second all squared. And you should find that this is equal to 510,000 joules, about half a million joules. That's a lot of kinetic energy. We've explored relating energy and quantities of energy to something a bit more physical, something we can relate to, like heating up water, if you've ever made coffee or tea, uh, ever made soup, anything that involves having to bring water to a boil or near the boiling point. You know it takes time. It takes a lot of energy and it takes time to get water to march up to its boiling point. And that's because water has a very high specific heat capacity. It's about four joules required to raise one uh, gram of water, one degree Celsius. So this is 510,000 joules. If we had some process for turning the kinetic energy of a car into pure heat energy that we could put into water, this would really heat up water very quickly. Now, what's the momentum of the car? So let's assume, let's define, that eastward is along the x direction in the positive x direction. So then we can write down the momentum of the car. The momentum of the car is the product of the mass and the speed and the direction in which the car is moving, which is the positive i-hat direction. So I need only put in m and v 
and I'll get a number out of this. And so this will help us to understand the units of momentum, which I've always found a little bit awkward, um, but it will also give us a sense of comparison between these things. So in terms of momentum, the car has a, a, a numerical quantity of momentum of 42,000. Now, what are the units on that? Well, they're kilograms times meters divided by second squared, mass times speed, kilogram meters per second. All right, so we see that these are both big numbers. Well, great, what does that mean? It's moving in the positive I hat direction, 42,000 kilogram meters per second. How can we humanize this? We'll come back to that question in a little bit especially when we start thinking about changes in momentum, changes in the state of either velocity or the quantity of mass, and what that can do to a physical system, perhaps a car carrying a person, for instance. Before we do that, though, let's expand our thinking to more than just one particle-like object. You know, a moment ago, I was essentially engaging in that old exercise from the first part of this course, where I take a car and I think about all of its mass being compressed at a point. And we now know from our previous look at the center of mass that that's okay as long as I compress all the mass to the center of mass. I can think about the center of mass of all the Avogadro's number worth of atoms in the electric car all moving together at once. So on the heels of our look at how to describe collections of particles or extended material bodies, we can then also determine the total momentum of a large collection of particles. It would just be obtained by taking one particle, getting its momentum, and taking another particle and getting its momentum, and adding those up, taking a third particle and doing the same thing, getting the sum, and doing this for all n particles in the system. Now, in, in a car, n is about Avogadro's number or so, but maybe it's only three or four particles that we're having to worry about here. Maybe it's a bunch of pool balls on a, on a, on a pool table, a game of billiards, and you just have to track the motions of the balls treating each ball like an individual particle. Fine, you sum them up and in mathematical summation, summation notation, we have the sum from uh, particle label i equals one to n of the vector pi for each particle. Now, just to sneak ahead, if it were true that momentum can be a conserved quantity, well, this would be quite useful because whatever momentum a system began with, if we could isolate it and close it off and then know that once we've achieved that, the momentum inside the system does not change, then we would know exactly the momentum the system would end with. Okay, that's a potentially useful thing, but we're not quite there yet. So before we get into that, let's consider what it means for momentum to change. So let's go back again to the comfortable example of a single particle with some mass m. What does it mean if its momentum changes? So let's consider a small change in momentum, which I'll denote dp, meaning tiny change in momentum, in some equally small amount of time, dt, meaning a tiny amount of a tiny change in time. So let's fix the mass of the particle m so that it can never change. This particle is indivisible. It can be sped up, or it can be slowed down, but you can't break its mass up into any other pieces. Fine, so it's an indivisible particle. m is a fixed, it's a constant. It doesn't change in time. Okay, well in that case, I can start thinking about time rate of change of momentum. To do that, I would write down the first derivative with respect to time of the momentum vector. Well, plugging in the definition of momentum for a single particle, this is the time rate of change of the product of the mass and the velocity. But the mass is a constant. It doesn't change in time. And so using the rules of calculus, we can take that constant, pull it out of the action of the derivative, move it comfortably off to the left-hand side, and deal with what's going on in the velocity vector. So let's do that. I've moved mass off to the left side. I still have the first derivative with respect to time. And now I've made another substitution. I've put in the fact that velocity is itself the first derivative with respect to time of position. Well, the derivative with respect to time of the derivative with respect to time of position is this very definition of the second derivative of the position with respect to time. The derivative of the derivative is the second derivative. So I can write this more compactly as m times the second derivative of r with respect to time. Well, this is a wonderful tangle I've created for myself. What does it mean 
to have the second derivative of coordinate location with respect to time. Why? That's the very definition of acceleration. What I've written here is that the time rate of change of momentum is ultimately equal to mass times acceleration. The second derivative of position with respect to time is acceleration. So what we have learned is that this quantity here is actually equal to mass times acceleration, which from Newton's second law of motion must be equal to the sum of the forces acting on this particle. So we have learned that changes in momentum with respect to time are related to net forces acting on this particle. Newton's second law of motion has just been totally recast in terms of the momentum concept. And in fact, this was something that Newton himself had done. This is in fact profound. Momentum, momentum should only ever change under the influence of a net external force. That, this equation tells us, is what makes momentum change. This internal quantity that has both direction and magnitude carried by a body is only altered by forces. So let's reconsider a system of particles. Given this recasting of Newton's second law, we can relate the changes in momentum, the center of mass, and external forces on a system of particles. It must be true that if I consider changes in the momentum of an entire system of particles, the sum of all the individual momenta with respect to time, that that must be equal in the end to the total mass of the system times the second derivative with respect to time of the position of the center of mass of the system. This is just an extension of the center of mass concepts from the previous material in this course. So for a complicated system of particles, all of which may be moving around, colliding with each other, we need only determine the acceleration of the center of mass of the system, whose total mass is m, which is the sum of all the masses of the things that make up the system. OK, well, this must then needs be equal to the sum of all the external forces on the system. After all, F equals ma tells us that acceleration even of a system of particles would be caused by a whole bunch of external forces adding up in some way to act on the system. We'll come back to this in a bit because this bears on the conservation of momentum. But before we do that, I want to humanize the concept of momentum a little bit more. And I want to talk about changes in momentum and another concept. It's only a small extension of what we've been doing already called impulse. Now, we are pretty familiar with the world around us and thus the everyday idea that when two objects collide with each other, changes in the state of motion are possible. Imagine bouncing a basketball on a basketball court. You throw the ball at the floor. That's what you're doing when you're dribbling. The ball hits the floor and it rebounds back up toward your hand. You catch it with your hand again and you push it back down to the floor. You are changing the momentum of that ball constantly. Your hand changes the momentum vector to point down. The floor changes the momentum vector when it collides with the ball to point up and you repeat and that's dribbling. A softball bat makes contact with a softball and the direction and the magnitude of the ball's velocity is changed. Also, if you've ever been a batter yourself, either in cricket or baseball, uh, any sport where you have to strike something with uh, a stick. Field hockey is another good example. Okay, You know that, that striking that object also affects the motion of the bat or the stick. Okay, So you also have a sense that it's not just you putting energy into changing the state of motion of the ball, but the action of the ball on the stick also affects the state of motion of the stick. We know, therefore, because direction and magnitude of velocity can both be changing in these situations, there must be some acceleration present, and that implies a force. So let's see if we can understand the force associated with these kinds of changes in momentum. So let's define this thing called impulse. Impulse is simply a statement of the change in momentum 
between two times. Okay, so again, think about striking a uh, softball with a softball bat. The ball is heading toward the bat. The two meet. The ball then rebounds off the bat, even as the bat continues to follow through on the swing. A good batter knows to follow through on the swing and not stop when they hit the ball. Give the momentum as much of a chance to work its change on the ball as possible. Um, the ball is incoming toward the bat before the strike, and after the collision, it's outgoing away from the bat. There's a change in momentum, and it happens very quickly. It's within a, a second of time that that change occurs. So let's, let's define a quantity that's associated with that change. So if I take the momentum at a later time and I subtract off the momentum at an earlier time, I can write this as delta P. This is the same delta we've been writing this whole time, delta X, delta T, delta E, all of this stuff. Let's define that as this quantity J, a vector, which is defined as impulse. Now, it would be true that the larger the change in momentum, the larger the impulse. That's because of the definition here. So let's consider the consequences that such changes, especially large ones, could have in light of the connection between momentum changes, dp dt, and force, f. So let's begin by considering small changes in momentum over very short periods of time. We can relate impulse to the time-dependent force that could be causing accelerations, and we can do all of this using Newton's second law, recast using momentum. So let me start by writing down Newton's second law in terms of force and momentum. dp dt equals f. Now f is a force, it could be a sum of many forces, and I'm allowing it to have a time dependence. Maybe the force doubles with each instant of time that we consider in this problem. Now that's a time dependent force, it's not constant, and one would have to take that into consideration. I can recast this equation by moving the chunk of time, dt, to the other side in preparation for doing an integral. I'm going to add up all the little changes in momentum, dp. I'm going to add up all the little products of the force and the changes in time. And I'm going to see what I get. So let's do that. I then construct this integral. I'm going to sum up all the little dps. I'm going to sum up all the little products of f and dt. Now I have to have limits for these integrals. I'm going to have to sum from a minimum to a maximum value. So I'm going to have a minimum momentum. Maybe that's the momentum I start with at time one, p1. And I'm going to have a maximum momentum. Well, that's the momentum I end with at the time t2. Let's call that p2. So I have two times, t1 and t2, and two corresponding momenta, p1 and p2. So let's go ahead and consider these definite momenta and times as limits on the integral. So we're going to go from an indefinite integral, a sum without limits, to a definite integral, a sum with limits. And we arrive at a formal definition of impulse. The integral from the minimum momentum, p1, to the later momentum, p2, of dp, well, that's just going to give us p, the momentum evaluated at the endpoints, p2 and p1. And so we wind up with p2 vector minus p1 vector. Well, by definition, that's the delta of p. That's the difference, the change in momentum from time t1 to t2. It's the later momentum minus the initial momentum. And that is, by definition, the impulse. So finally, we arrive at a formal definition of impulse in terms of force and time. That is the integral from the earlier time t1 to the later time t2 of this product of the force, which could be a function of time, and dt. Now, of course, I have to know the, the functional form to really do this integral formally. That would be specific to a problem. Maybe the force decreases quadratically as a function of time. Great, so I'll have some t squared or t to the minus 2 dependence in this. But what we learn from this, no matter what, the bigger the change in momentum over short times, the bigger the force that we're talking about. That can be very bad. If we, for instance, knew the average force and the average time over which it acts, we could say that the impulse on average is just the average force times delta t, the time difference between the two. So without knowing the exact function that describes force as a, a function of time, let's take a look at an example, uh, a car accident. This is a very human example of something that can happen involving a change in momentum. And as a result, it's very interesting to look at the risks to a human being 
under the conditions of such changes in momentum. So let's say that our electric car from earlier moving at 55 miles an hour with a mass of 1700 kilograms accidentally crashes into a solid wall. The wall or the barrier that it strikes cannot move. It's firmly rooted to earth and it can't move at all. Well, in those cases, and we can see this by looking at videos of crash tests where you put human analogs, so-called crash test dummies inside of a vehicle, either seat belted in or not seat belted in, a car with airbags or without airbags, and you ram the vehicle with its analogs for human passengers into barricades at various angles, head on, glancing blow, side impact. And you can see that this causes tremendous damage to a vehicle moving at even modest highway speeds. Even at 25 to 30 miles an hour, you can do tremendous damage to a car. At 55 miles an hour, as we'll see, things can get lethal. So let's assume that the car strikes the barrier and it will compress, it will crumple, and it will come to a complete stop. It will lose all of its speed. Well, from an energy perspective, we have a sense of what's going on. The car has kinetic energy, but the kinetic energy is given up to deforming the car during the collision. It goes into altering the chemical bonds internally in the vehicle, but this changes the internal energy of the car. It goes into heating, metal, the barrier, and so forth from friction. Um, that kinetic energy can be dissipated in many ways, but the bottom line is that it takes you from a state of motion non-zero motion to a state of zero motion. So we'll take the mass of the car again to be 1700 kilograms and the initial speed of the car to be 55 miles an hour, 24.6 meters per second. The change in momentum is easily computed. The impulse, which is the change in momentum, is the later momentum minus the earlier momentum. So we're considering the later time to be just after the crash when the car has stopped and the earlier to be the speed of the, the momentum of the car before it strikes the barrier, just before it strikes the barrier. So we have a situation where we have no momentum at the end and momentum MV at the beginning. And so we wind up with a negative change in momentum, a decline in the momentum of the vehicle. This makes sense. So all the momentum we had earlier, 42,000 kilogram meters per second is now depleted from the car during this change. It comes to rest after the accident. So let's see if we can turn this into some other information that will give us a sense of say what could happen to the vehicle or what could happen to the passenger inside the vehicle. Now one thing we need to know is how long does an accident like this take? Well you can look at data for measurements of speed and time in crash tests. And you'll find out that this compression, this deceleration to zero speed, takes about 0.05 seconds. This is incredibly fast. This is why in an accident, people often have a very hard time remembering what happened. It happens fast. They may be unaware of the conditions under which the accident occurs. And by the time all the damage is done, almost no time has passed. Now using this information that an average time over which this accident will occur is about 0.05 seconds from the moment just before striking the barrier to coming to a complete stop or a nearly complete stop after compressing the vehicle, we can solve for the average force. So the impulse will be related to the average force times the, the time over which the average force is acting. We can rearrange and solve for the average force and we find out that the average force that's causing this change is, uh, you know, of, has a magnitude of 840,000 newtons. Ouch is about the nicest thing I could say. 840,000 newtons acting on a vehicle is a lot of force. Um, let's take a look at what this would do to a passenger. Again, we're trying to come up with a human scale idea of what changes in momentum over short periods of time mean. Now, a person inside the car might have a mass of 75 kilograms. The car is 1,700 kilograms. A person is far smaller than that, maybe 75 kilograms or thereabouts. Now, let's assume that they're seat belted into the car. Now, that's important because when you're seat belted into the car, you are part of the car. And so if the car slows, you slow. And if the car stops, you stop. And if the action of the seat belt is fast enough to hold you in place, 
your motion will really be defined by what the car's motion is doing. You are part of the car. You're a collection of atoms that is part of the larger collection of atoms of the vehicle itself. So as a human, because you're bound to the vehicle, you will experience the same time duration required to stop. But because your mass is different, you will experience a different change in momentum. So a human being's mass is far less than that of the cars, and thus there's a different force acting on you. So let's repeat this exercise. Okay, if you plug in the numbers, mass is 75 kilograms, average time to stop is about 0.05 seconds. This assumes no airbag, and I'll talk about the airbag in a moment, okay? But this assumes no airbag, that basically you are stopping at exactly the same rate as the vehicle. And so the force on you is 37,900 newtons or thereabouts. So what does that mean? Well, let's use Newton's second law to figure out what that means. If you do F equals MA and you figure out what the acceleration of the driver experiences in, it has a magnitude of 486 meters per second squared. Compare that to the acceleration due to gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared. This is a multiple of 50 times the acceleration due to gravity or a g-force of 50 g's. That is a lethal acceleration. If you take a look at a chart of acceleration versus human health outcome, 50 g's is capable of killing you. So you can see why a car accident into a fixed barricade at 55 miles an hour is an extremely dangerous situation. Car accidents at highway speeds are bad, and at 70 miles an hour, the problem is even worse. Run this calculation for highway speeds that are more typical in Texas and, and many parts of the United States now. 70 miles an hour, take a car down to zero miles an hour in about 0.05 seconds, take a human down to zero miles an hour in about 0.05 seconds, and see what kind of g-force, what multiple of g we're talking about. You'll find it's well in excess of 50. It's well beyond what's required to kill a human being. But this is also why airbags exist and why they're so useful. What does an airbag do? An airbag is an explosive device that sends a pillowy cushion out at you filled with air. It shoots it out at you from the steering column. So as you are being decelerated toward the front of the car as the car compresses, the airbag's job is to expand outward faster than 0.05 seconds to get out to a distance and catch you and then gently decompress, slowing the time it takes for you to come to zero miles per hour. So if you watch a test involving a, a, a crash test dummy and an airbag, watch how long it takes the car to come to essentially zero speed versus how much longer in comparison it takes the, the, the crash test dummy to come to essentially zero speed. It can extend 0.05 seconds up as far as one second. So instead of the time the car is being stopped, the human is stopped over a much longer time. So the delta T goes from 0.05 seconds to one second. This reduces the average force on a human from 37,900 newtons or so down to only 1,900 newtons, which still sounds bad, but using Newton's second law, you'll find out that that's a deceleration of about 25 meters per second squared. And as multiples of G goes, that's only about 3G. That's extremely survivable. It won't feel good, but it shouldn't be too dangerous either. So the, the data backs up that airbags play a valuable role in reducing harm to the passenger. So maybe this will give you a more human level sense of scale of what momentum and changes in momentum mean on the person sizes of things. Now, let's go back to something I put on pause in order to more humanize momentum and go back to Newton's second law and think about changes in momentum with respect to time and force and what it means if we have a closed and isolated system. So, if we observe that there is no net external force that acts on a system, that is, if it's closed and isolated from such forces, then it must be true that F is zero. And if F is zero, dp dt for any system of particles is also zero. So we've learned something quite profound. 
if we can isolate and close off a system so that we have no unaccounted for external forces that can act on a system, then it must be true that even as time changes, the total momentum of the system will not. And momentum would be conserved. And we can write this as the total momentum of a system of particles where the system is closed and isolated is a constant, which implies that the momentum at any initial time, Ti, is the same at any final time, Tf. Pi equals Pf. And that's a vector statement. That's not just a scalar statement. That's not a magnitude of momentum. That also includes the direction of the net momentum of the system. This is insanely useful for understanding not only motion, but degree of motion in a system. And this is how we're able to make predictions about not only the degree of motion of a system, but its directionality as well. This is the law of conservation of linear momentum. And when conditions are right for applying this, you will absolutely find this an invaluable tool in addition to the conservation of energy for understanding physical situations. This is a concept that is absolutely as useful and on equal footing with the conservation of energy. If the net forces on a system sum up to zero along, in fact, any coordinate direction, if it's not true that there are zero net forces in Y and Z, but there are zero net forces in X, then you have some profound statement about X. The momentum along the X direction will be conserved along that direction. It gives you a handle for solving difficult problems when something is conserved. I talked about Emmy Nuther, the mathematical physicist, in the lecture on the conservation of energy. We can understand the conservation of momentum from Nuther's theorems as well. Energy was conserved according to Nuther's theorems because the laws of nature are, have, a, they have a continuous symmetry under time. Linear momentum is conserved in nature because the laws of nature also have a continuous symmetry in space. Small changes in the equations of motion or the laws of nature in space do not affect the outcome of the system. So if I shifted the whole universe continuously by teeny tiny amounts of space, the universe according to Noether's theorems, wouldn't notice it. And as a result of that, momentum is conserved. This is an incredible statement. So there's a deep connection between mathematical symmetries and laws of nature and conservation laws. So let's look at kinetic energy and momentum. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. Momentum is a quantity of motion. It carries both magnitude and direction. So we have two concepts related to moving bodies, about things that are inherent to those moving material bodies. We have kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, but we now also have linear momentum, p vector equals m times v vector. So let's consider how these two interplay with one another in solving problems and understanding natural phenomena, because we can use both of them to tackle difficult problems. In all cases, I want you to consider for now an ideal, closed, and isolated system. So if a system of particles, that is material objects, move and interact in such a way that the total kinetic energy remains unchanged, that is, energy doesn't change form from kinetic to anything else in any significant way or at all, then this is known as a system that is undergoing elastic collisions. So I can show you an example of this. For instance, I can take a frictionless air track. This is like an air hockey table, but in one dimension. You can place an object, uh, a cart, that has a little V shape that fits over the track. It rides on a cushion of air. And if the track is well balanced, it won't accelerate if you leave it very still on the track. If you impart momentum to the cart and then stop acting on it, it's got little bumpers on each end, and it will bounce off the end of the track and then change its direction of motion, changing its momentum, and then it will bounce off the other end of the track and change its direction of momentum. But notice that the magnitude of momentum doesn't appear to be changing. The velocity of this cart, whose mass isn't changing, the velocity may be changing direction, but the speed is not changing. So it looks like kinetic energy is conserved, and it also looks like the magnitude of momentum is conserved, even if during these collisions with the walls of the track, um, the momentum is changed. But nonetheless, the total momentum is not changing. 
So this is a system that's an example of one that's undergoing elastic collisions. Now, if instead such a system changes its total kinetic energy over time, for instance, energy is lost to potential energy in some way, or goes into other forms like thermal energy, then the system is said to be undergoing inelastic collisions. So the car accident I showed you before is a good example of an inelastic collision. Kinetic energy is clearly transformed during the collision to the compression of the car. The kinetic energy is absolutely lost in this collision. Uh, another good example is two bodies that are, are able to move, but they stick together during the collision process and move off as one body after that. This is an extreme that is known as a totally inelastic collision. So if you start with two things and they collide and stick together and now you have one big thing at the end, that is a totally inelastic collision. In these cases, kinetic energy is absolutely lost from the system. And these objects are now locked together. But what's important to recognize is that while total kinetic energy may change during inelastic collisions, total momentum does not. Total momentum in a closed and isolated system never changes, even if kinetic energy changes. Using these ideas together, you can imagine how useful it will be for setting up and solving problems. So let's take a look at um, collisions. All right. So I've talked about elastic collisions, one where the kinetic energy doesn't change in the system over time, and inelastic collisions, one where the kinetic energy can change in the system over time. Now for all such collisions in a closed isolated system, it will be true that the initial momentum total is equal to the final momentum total, closed and isolated system. So for elastic collisions, it will also be true that the final kinetic energy of the whole system is equal to the initial kinetic energy of the whole system. That is, the kinetic energy total of the system will never change. The sum of one half mv squared for all particles at any time will be the same, even if their v's are changing over time. Now in inelastic collisions, we have a different case. In this case, we have kinetic energy as a total can change. So for instance, it could decline over time as a result of collisions, or maybe it could be increased over time as a result of explosions within the system that break objects apart. In this case, final and initial kinetic energies will not be the same, and we will have to rely on momentum to help us deal with the problem. But one thing that's very helpful here will be that the velocity of the center of mass of such systems will not be affected by collisions. And that will give us a constant phenomenon to consider even in complex situations. Okay, So that's something we'll try to exercise, but something to keep in mind. So let's take a look at an example of an elastic collision. Specifically, imagine having two masses that are equal. So in I could arrange this, for instance, with two carts on this frictionless uh, air cushion track. They're both of mass M, the same mass, at least if the manufacturer's done a good job. And I can construct a situation where the initial velocity of the first mass is non-zero, and it's moving in the positive x direction. So we'll denote this as v with a subscript 1 comma i for the initial velocity of the first mass. But I have a second mass, also m, that's initially at rest. The first mass collides elastically with the second. What I mean by that is that momentum is conserved, but also kinetic energy is conserved by this collision. So what would I predict will be the final velocities, v1 final and v2 final, along the x direction? Well, we know a couple of things. For instance, we know that the kinetic energy shouldn't change with time. Whatever the total kinetic energy was at the beginning, that will be the total kinetic energy at the end. Well, the kinetic energy at the beginning is just the kinetic energy of the first mass. The second mass has none. It's not moving. The total kinetic energy at the end, well, we don't know what the velocities are going to be. So it's going to be 1 half mv1 final squared plus 1 half mv2 final squared. It's going to be some sum like this. Well, 1 half and m appear on all terms, so it cancels from both sides of the equation. I'm left with just a relationship between the sums of the squares of velocities on one side and the square of a velocity on the other. So the square of the initial velocity of mass 1 is equal to the sum of the squares of the final velocities of 1 and 2, whatever they are. We're going to try to see if we can make a prediction about what those velocities are going to be. That's what we get from the conservation of kinetic energy in this elastic collision situation. From the conservation of momentum, we get a slightly different equation. We have that the velocity of the first uh, object is non-zero, 
but the second object is zero at the beginning of, of the problem, and then after the collision, we don't know what the velocities are going to be. They could be non-zero. So we have that mv1 initial is equal to mv1 final plus mv2 final. And again, the m is common to all three terms, and so it cancels from both sides, and we get a different statement about the velocities. Not only is the sum of the squares of the final velocities equal to the square of the initial velocity of the first cart, or mass, the sum of the velocities of the final masses must be equal to the velocity of the first mass, or cart. So, great. If I define what the initial velocity is, if I make it a definite number, like 10 centimeters per second or something like that, and I want to predict what the final velocities are, I have two unknowns, v1f and v2f, and I have two equations. I can solve this. This is a solvable problem. I can make definite predictions given an initial velocity for the cart, where the second one is initially at rest. I can make definite predictions about the velocities of the two carts after the collision. So let me remind you of the velocity relationships that we've gotten from kinetic energy conservation and from momentum conservation. We can do a substitution where we take the fact that v1 final is equal to v1 initial minus v2 final. I get that from the conservation of momentum equation. I can then plug that substitution into the kinetic energy based equation. And I will find the following, that v1 initial squared is equal to this substitution squared plus v2 final squared. And if I expand out that, that polynomial of v1 minus v2, uh, v1 initial minus v2 final all squared, I get this beast here. I invite you to do some algebra gymnastics. Uh, group terms together, cancel out terms that have opposite signs between them, but otherwise are the same. And at the end of this, rearrange and solve for v2 final. And if you do that, you'll find that v2 final is equal to v1 initial. So what this tells us is that the final velocity of the second cart or mass is equal to the initial velocity of the first cart or mass. And if we plug that result into the momentum equation, we find out that that means that after the collision, the first mass has no velocity whatsoever. It's not moving. Is this what really happens? Is it true that if I take a cart of mass m and I slam it into another cart of equal mass that's initially at rest, that the second cart gets all the momentum and the first one comes to a complete stop? Let's take a look and see what happens. In fact, it is. In fact, we see that the first cart transfers all of its momentum to the second one, which takes off, rebounds off the end of the frictionless track, smacks into the first one, kicks it off again, and then comes back. Now, the track is not perfectly balanced, so gravity is uh, accelerating these carts a little bit. It's uh, slightly inclined. And of course, there this isn't a perfectly isolated and closed system. There's turbulent flow from the air that's flowing up through the holes in the track and so forth. This is not a perfect ideal closed system, but it's fairly close to one, and it's really remarkable to see this experiment happen in reality. Let's take a look at one more example before we close out this lecture, and that's the example of rocketry. Rocketry is a slightly different case than the one we've been considering already. In the case of the colliding carts, the mass of cart one and the mass of cart two were the same the whole time. They don't shed mass. But what's a rocket? A rocket is a large vessel containing fuel. The fuel mass and the rocket mass together form the mass of the whole uh, vehicle. You ignite the fuel chemically, for instance. You do some kind of chemical reaction. And this increases pressure in the vessel, which spits mass out the back end of the rocket. You're taking the original mass of the rocket and you're declining it essentially by throwing mass out the back end. So the secret to rocketry, that is launching an object from the Earth, say, and putting it up into space, it's not the force of the exhaust against air or the ground. I mean, after all, rockets continue to accelerate even long after their exhaust plume isn't touching the ground anymore. 
And it's not because that exhaust plume is pushing on the air. Rockets work just as well in space. Rockets are used to reposition things in space all the time. There's no air. So it's not pushing against anything. So how do rockets work? Well, rockets work by taking advantage of the fact that ejecting mass out the back of a vessel is also a change in momentum. Remember, momentum is mv. And I originally considered the case where m was constant and v could change, but m could change. And v could also change. And you could have two changes. You could have an m change and a v change, and those would also be changes in momentum. That can cause an impulse, and that results in a force. Changes in momentum with respect to time exert forces. So in one dimension, if we think about a rocket as moving along only one dimension, we're going to have a situation where the force exert, you know, the, the force that's experienced by the, by, the, by the vessel as it ejects mass out the back will be related to dp dt, which is the time derivative of the product in m and v. But now we have a situation where m and v can change. And so we have a chain rule situation. m is a function of time, v is a function of time. So I have to do the chain rule on this product. And I wind up with v dm dt plus m dv dt. This is the result of doing the, the faithful execution of the chain rule, assuming that m is a function of time and v is a function of time. So if speed is changing, momentum is changing. We've seen that already, that this term on the right is not a surprise. But if mass is changing with time, then momentum is also changing. And force can result from either kind of momentum change. Rockets take advantage of this. More to the point, a rocket fuel system is a closed and isolated system, especially in space. So it's not so much that there are external forces on the system that cause changes in momentum. It's that changes in mass cause changes in the speed of the rocket. So throwing mass out the back causes the speed of the vessel to change in response. Rockets take advantage of this. They consume fuel at some rate, and that rate can be given as uh, uh, the negative of the change of the mass of the rocket with respect to time. After all, when you kick mass out the back, you, uh, you still have the same total mass, the exhaust plume and the rocket all together have the same mass, but the vessel itself has less mass than it did before because you kicked exhaust out the back. So you're expelling mass out the back, that's dm dt. This in response in a closed system will cause a dv dt for the remaining object. So let's apply this. Let's use conservation of momentum. So we have a closed and isolated system, rocket plus its fuel starts burning the fuel and ejecting mass out the back. Let's see what happens. Conservation of momentum will apply for a closed and isolated system. So we know that the sum of external forces will be zero. And whatever the total momentum at the beginning before it ejects a mass out the back is, that will be equal to the total momentum at the end after the mass has been ejected. So we have a system where we have a rocket of initial mass, big M, moving at a velocity V initially. Relative to us, we're viewing this whole process from the rest frame outside the rocket. It then expels some mass. So it's losing mass. dm is a negative quantity. And that exhaust, that ejected mass, leaves at a velocity of um, u relative to us. So from the perspective of the vessel, the fuel is moving away from the rocket. From our perspective, the fuel might still be moving in the direction of the rocket, albeit getting separated from it as time goes on. So this is a kind of relative frame problem as well, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So ejecting this matter out the back will cause some change in the velocity of the rocket. So it starts at v, but then after ejecting mass dm, it will be at v plus dv. And again, that's relative to us, the outside observer. So we can write this conservation equation as the original momentum, the mass of the original rocket times its original speed, v, must be equal to the negative of dm. Remember, dm is a, is a, is a negative uh, decline, so this is actually a positive uh, momentum here, times the, the velocity of the, of the exhaust products. And then the mass of the rocket is now changed. It's m plus dm. Remember, dm is a negative change, so this actually is a decline in the total mass of the rocket, and v plus dv. Now, all of these speeds have been measured relative to a stationary observer. That's us. But the rocket has a speed relative to its own exhaust products. And that's given by the relative velocity of the rocket to its exhaust products as v plus dv minus u. So using this information in the above equation, we can then substitute. We can substitute in and rearrange, and we get 
uh, if we move terms around, we can get mv equals mv plus dv plus dm v plus dv minus u. And v plus dv minus u is exactly the velocity of the rocket relative to its exhaust products. And so if we rearrange this one more time, we will find that 0 is equal to mdv plus dm times vrel. So that is that the change in velocity of the rocket times the original mass of the rocket plus the loss of mass from the rocket due to fuel times the relative velocity of the rocket and the fuel are related to each other. And we can in fact solve for the change in velocity in terms of these other things. Now, if we divide both sides by a small change in time, if we think about changes in velocity with respect to time, then we have dv dt on the left side. That's acceleration. And we get an equation that relates the acceleration of the rocket, the original mass of the rocket, including its original fuel complement, the change in mass with respect to time, that is how fast it can eject fuel out the back, and the velocity of the rocket relative to its own fuel. So that would be, for instance, the speed with which the exhaust shoots out the back of the rocket. That would be measured, for instance, with respect to the rocket. So somebody standing in the rocket could kind of look and see, oh, all the exhaust that's shooting out the back is, is going out at 100 meters per second. That's a VREL. This uh, little exercise, uh, plugging in for the fuel burn rate, R, gets us to one of the what's known as the rocket equations. The acceleration of the rocket times its original mass, including its fuel, is equal to the rate it burns fuel times the speed of the fuel once it's ejected relative to the rocket. That's a lot to process. Let's actually do an example and see what we can learn from this. Can a fire extinguisher be used to turn me into a rocket? So using the above information, how would I do this? Well, I want to make it, I, I can't go into space. I wouldn't be able to breathe and it's expensive to get there anyway. So instead I'm going to try to reduce friction. So I'm going to reduce the fact that the ground wants to resist my motion by sitting on a cart with wheels. And I'm going to hold a fire extinguisher and I'm going to try to keep my, my, my center of gravity as low as possible so that the fire extinguisher doesn't tilt me over, which would be funny for you, but painful for me. Now the empty mass of a fire extinguisher is about 18 kilograms or so. Um, but uh, a fully loaded fire extinguisher has about 10 kilograms of compressed carbon dioxide in it. So we have about a 28 kilogram fire extinguisher. If you add the mass of the card and my mass and the mass of a fully loaded fire extinguisher together, that's the mass of our rocket. That's big M. And that comes out to be about 120 kilograms or thereabouts. So that's our rocket mass. So there we go. There's our big M. Fire extinguisher, including its fuel, and me, and the cart, 120 kilograms. Now fire extinguishers can discharge their contents in about four or so seconds. So the rate of discharge is 10 kilograms of CO2 ejected in four seconds, or 10 kilograms over four seconds, which is 2.5 kilograms per second. When you fire a fire extinguisher, you don't have a lot of time to use it, your aim must be true, and you're not gonna get a lot of time out of it, but they're designed to put fires out quickly, so that's okay. So the, the so-called burn rate of fuel uh, is two and a half kilograms per second from a typical fire extinguisher that you might find in, say, Fondren Science Building. Now the contents are expelled at speeds that are about 20 meters per second. So if I lock the fire extinguisher in place and I measure the speed with which the exhaust products shoot out the back, that comes out to be something like 20 meters per second. That is the velocity of the exhaust relative to the rocket because the, the fire extinguisher will be fixed to the cart, which will be, and I will be fixed to all of that. I'll be holding all of this down. And so the speed of the exhaust relative to me is going to be 20 meters per second. So we can make a prediction. What's the acceleration of me and the fire extinguisher and the cart as I blow CO2 out the back? Well, plug in the numbers. The acceleration will be the burn rate of CO2 over the original mass of the rocket times the relative speed of the exhaust to the rocket. And you'll find out that this is maybe a, a, an underwhelming 0.4 meters per second squared. That doesn't sound very exciting. 0.4 meters per second squared, blech. But let's assume that that's a constant acceleration and I can get that over the you know time required for the exhaust products to completely be exhausted from the fire extinguisher. Um, 
what does this mean? Well, it means I could travel roughly the front of the room, which is a distance of six meters in Fondren Science 123, our typical lecture room here in the physics department. I could expect to, you know, using the equations of motion that we learned earlier in the class, at this constant acceleration rate of 0.4 meters per second squared, I could expect to go six meters in about five seconds. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. So if I sit on a cart with a fully loaded fire extinguisher, and I brace myself around the fire extinguisher and aim it backward and pull the trigger on the fire extinguisher and I can get that thing to go for four or five seconds of exhaust, I should be able to push myself six meters, almost the full distance across the front of the lecture room. I say let's try it and see what happens. extinguisher on a cheap cart with friction in the wheels and a person like me can do fun things you can see how rockets work so fantastically well it took a long time to perfect the art of rocketry and to this day it's still something where especially if you're going to put a human payload inside a rocket you have to be extremely careful but nonetheless we as a species have become quite effective at going somewhere by leaving something behind and ultimately that is what rockets do they get you someplace by forcing you to leave something behind. By changing the mass of the object, you can change its speed. And even in a closed and isolated system, even in outer space, if you can find a way to do this, if you can find a way to alter mass, you can affect speed via the conservation of momentum. It is a remarkable fact of nature, and it works incredibly well. Let's review the key ideas that we have explored in this section of the course. We have defined the momentum of an object, and we have used that quantity to revisit Newton's second law of motion. In doing so, we have learned about the relationship between momentum and force. Specifically, forces cause changes in momentum with respect to time. And if there are no changes in momentum with respect to time, it means there are no net external forces on the system, and as a result, it's possible for momentum to be a conserved quantity. Now that, of course, is in a closed and isolated system, but those are typically the systems we'll try to construct or consider when we're thinking about solving problems. We've taken a look at a couple of applications of momentum, and specifically momentum conservation in such systems. We looked at the elastic collision of two equal masses and saw the remarkable fact that momentum is transferred from one colliding object entirely into the next and then back again in a sort of lovely little dance. We've also looked at the case where mass is changing and seen that in a closed and, and relatively isolated system, when mass is changing, it's possible to alter the velocity of the, of the remainder of the system in such a way to develop the entire field of engineering known as rocketry. All of this depends on the momentum concept, changes in momentum, and an understanding that momentum can be conserved under certain conditions.